city as a cosmos is dominated by form and formalism. The form is the dominant factor. City as a machine, which is this lecture, is dominated, dominated by the operation of one or more systems. And the city as an organism is dominated by a set of forces that are small relative to the other two. It's not a singular preconceived form. It is not the operation of a system. It is actually something at a more molecular level like the DNA of an organism, that there is a code uh, embedded in social or other uh, relationships that naturally generates formal relationships that are characterized by uh, a sense of emergence. And so formalism, system, and emergence are the three characteristics of design that we're talking about in the context of cities. But those three, the one of the reasons why I'm emphasizing this uh, in this version of this course is that these three aspects are increasingly a very conscious aspect of architectural design. After a period in, of which, in which form was the be-all and end-all of everything, a lot of architects are experimenting with the idea of systems that are having a greater impact on des the design process, especially architects who are exploring the areas of landscape urbanism or other areas of urbanism where the urban systems uh, have an influence on what the design, what the designer proposes. And then uh, the third thing, the more organic or emergent aspects of design have recently um, become very important to many people. Uh, and that can be seen in the rise of parametric design uh, methods. Uh, also, the, uh, the engagements people, uh, designers have had in disaster relief or informal settlements in the developing world. Um, and so in that context, we delve into our second paradigm, which is uh, the city as a machine. And we go back to um, Greece and the city of Miletus, uh, despite the fact that this site is extremely irregular, a very difficult topography, uh, a very non-orthogonal uh, form of a peninsula. Um, this city is laid out according to a grid pattern. Now, why would, you, why would a grid pattern be the pattern that is favored, even though the topography is so difficult? Uh, and you can see it blown up here in this drawing. Uh, think of San Francisco. Why does San Francisco, of all places, have a grid pattern? Um, and so that's the key question to bear in mind as we move forward. Some, uh, if, if no one had ever invented the grid, we would invent it. Uh, cities didn't emerge from one place and then spread. Cities emerged in multiple places. They emerged uh, in the sense of they organically were produced because of the needs of the local population and the local situation. Uh, the most famous uh, gridded city and gridded civilization that we study in the history of architecture uh, is Rome. And Rome's grid is a very specific grid, and it had a huge impact globally, uh, especially in Europe. So even though the grid system has so many natural advantages that if we didn't know about it, we would invent it. It's kind of like the wheel. The wheel is very useful because there are no corners, and so it rides smoothly over even rough terrain. Similarly, and in a way the opposite, grids are extremely useful because they generate a, a regularity, uh, and uh, they have advantages uh, that outweigh other geometric forms of settlement. Um, the specific historical grid of the Roman system uh, starts with the um, 
these grid on the, the Cardo and the Decumanus, uh, crossing at the center of, of Roman, idealized Roman settlements. And even when the dominant form is internally a grid, uh, the exterior boundaries are often not. And so even though this is the idealized form of the Roman settlement, often uh, Roman settlements ended up being uh, not bounded by a grid. Uh, the brilliant invention of the geometry of the grid uh, was in part due to uh, the Roman system of surveying, in which they used a groma, this device, uh, in order to establish through sight lines um, the grid across the surface of uh, the earth. And one of the things that is key to many of the principles of both architecture and urban form is that light and vision travels in straight lines. You knew that when you were two years old. Uh, it's important to continue to know that, but now that we're in college, to be able to talk about it. Light and vision travels in straight lines. When a street uh, is straight, you can see from one end to the other. Uh, when it curves, you can't. It's as simple as that. It's an extremely powerful phenomenon of our experience. Rome itself is a lousy example of Roman planning. It's seven hills. There's a whole mythology around the relationship between the hills. Um, there's the Vatican. They definitely use sight lines to organize what they do but it's basically uh, a mess. So it became important uh, to, when extending its, impact, its power and control of a larger territory, that the Romans establish a pattern that can be easily replicated. And so the form of the Roman camp followed the ideal versions of the cardo, the decumanus, and the grid pattern that forms around it. And at the center of many, <coughs> especially European cities that were once settled uh, by the Romans, at the center to this very day, you can still see the imprint embedded in the city of the original Roman encampment on the river at the crossing. Um, and then this all came much later. And so this is true in Florence. It's true. Um, this is Florence. Uh, you can see the original position of the Roman encampment and the Cardo and Decomanus still imprinted on the city. Uh, Northern Africa, you can see uh, everywhere where the Romans uh, had military control. And they basically established colonies. I'm really sorry, some of these slides got too small. Um, they basically established a road system and a water aqueduct system that is across the Mediterranean world, reaching as far north as Scotland and, is, uh, and into northern Africa. And uh, the, so it was a vast territory centered on the Mediterranean that the Romans conquered and continued to control in part through their infrastructure. <clears throat> now their infrastructure was simultaneously pragmatic and it was a, a profound, undeniable demonstration of uh, Roman power. Uh, they established their grids across the landscape and, and the grid continues to be evident in the agricultural lands of Italy <clears throat> because the original lines of demarcation are still there. But they demonstrated uh, their divine power in that they created, uh, they were capable of creating geometric perfection. Through the use of the groma, they established a geometrically perfect form on the surface of the planet, thereby clearly demonstrating their superiority over all other uh, races and uh, societies. And so they quickly came to dominate 
in part because of this power. Oh, this is disappointing. There we go. So um, part of this uh, So this is uh, David Macaulay's uh, view. David Macaulay is an architect graduate of RISD who's written, fam become famous writing supposedly children's books, but full of insights in terms of these types of things. The Roman encampment would have its idealized form, Ricardo and Decumanus. The gateways out would aim towards the other settlements. And so even when, if we went back and looked at the views of Florence and London and other places that have uh, ancient Roman settlements at the center of their cities, you will be able to identify where the gates of the former walled city was because uh, the diagonal streets of the city continue to converge on the former locations of the gateways. So when you travel to Europe with friends or your parents, you can look at a map and say, there used to be a gate here. Uh, there used to be a wall here because you can see in the map that's where the diagonals of the streets come together and meet. <clears throat> and so the idealized Roman encampment uh, becomes a permanent settlement and then becomes uh, embedded at the at the core of a town. Sometimes the encampment came first, sometimes it came later, and the streets were, um, were adjusted. There are architectural uh, uses, building types, that characterize the Roman town. Uh, the Thermae Baths, the Forum, the Market, um, the Theater, uh, and uh, also the aqueduct system was crucial. And I hope we have, yes, we do. Um, the aqueduct was another remarkable achievement of engineering that this time, rather than uh, creating a perfect geometry on the horizontal plane, it is a perfect geometry uh, that creates the ability to transport water across long distances, even through over mountains. Uh, it's a remarkable system that um, very carefully controls the rate at which water flows so it doesn't erode the masonry, yet it needs to flow uh, fast enough to, to maintain forward motion, to, to supply the cities at the proper rate, uh, and to prevent stagnation. And so the pitch of these aqueducts were very scientifically uh, measured and very carefully uh, produced through a, a extraordinary system of innovations. Uh, the street system of the Roman city also had a lot to do with drainage. This is the original zebra crosswalk. They were basically stepping stones for when the streets were flooded. And the streets were part of the drainage system that uh, many cities of the world still struggle to achieve uh, this level of sophistication that was part of the Roman system. Here we go. They engineered roads that were built to last. They invented the crown in the street that uh, leads water to the edges that we still use, almost the identical profile. And they created a road system that covered northern Africa, uh, the entire uh, Mediterranean world, and deep into the United Kingdom. Um, you can still see those roads in modern day uh, maps. Uh, they were a primary factor in wars and conquests. This is just a map of some random place in Italy. It still refers to the Roman road uh, and the grids that emerge off of the Roman road. Now we go to the United States. What is uh, a good reason to use a grid? Well, when you design a building for a rectangular lot that is 25 feet wide and 100 feet deep, uh, you have automatically designed a building that fits on every lot that is 25 feet wide and 100 feet deep. And so it's an extremely efficient mode of mass production. Uh, so when is the form of a city or the mapping of a territory a mechanism of mass production? 
It's a mechanism of mass production when it is a grid. Um, people, Jefferson was the first one to propose the grid system for the continental United States, and it was eventually established uh, in this territory uh, and became a dominant system of that of miles, measured in miles and acres, uh, quarter sections. Uh, it's a very elaborate system, and it, it depends on a very strict set of monuments that establish the corners um, that you still see embedded. Um, the towns, we already found out that no one is from the Midwest, but if you were from the Midwest or if you spend any time there, you would be able to identify this pattern wherever you go. Um, and this was the pattern of selling land. So this land was sold to people who never saw it. This system of the grid allowed land to be sold uh, in the land markets in Chicago or New York or Philadelphia uh, before anyone had ever been near it. So people could purchase land without ever seeing it. <clears throat> the system is highly codified. Uh, and the baselines that create the uh, reference points for the maintenance, uh, establishment and maintenance of these grids uh, are located, are very important locations. Uh, sometimes they are centered on uh, mountains, but it allows people to uh, confirm the limits of the land um, across vast distances. And so when you fly over the United States, you see the outcome. And this is an interesting relationship between mapping, the abstractions of mapping, and the natural landscape. And in a way, it reverses the traditional system. It used to be that what we do is we, uh, we look at the landscape, and we map the natural features and register it on maps. This is a reversal of that. This is we take the abstraction of mapping and we impose that on the landscape no matter what physical features we find. And we also have to accommodate the fact that the Earth is a curved surface. And so there has to be these corrective jogs in the road system in the United States that results in hundreds of deaths every year. Um, but this is uh, the abstraction as imposed on the physical surface of the Earth. And you will find these markers everywhere uh, throughout cities across the nation. It's illegal to remove these markers uh, because these are the markers that establish this order uh, that is part of the machinery upon which everything depends. Thank you very much.